Hi, Tom Trento here, WSBR740, sunny Boca Raton, South Florida, on this beautiful Wednesday, October 8, 2014. What a show we have in store for you. In fact, as you're listening on the radio or watching, get your phones out, call your friends, tell them to get on uh, iHeartRadio, on WSBR740, on the AM dial, theunitedwest.org. It's 4 o'clock on the... East Coast. Actually, it's about five minutes after four right now on the East Coast. We have a, 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 a very disturbing short video I'm going to show you in a minute or two with one of these ISIS Mujahideen challenging, challenging the West to fight man to man, mano a mano. You're going to see that in a minute. It's kind of shocking. And then today we have, um, we've been publicizing uh, Ambassador Yoram Ettinger from Israel. He is delayed right now. We hope he'll be calling into the show uh, shortly. When he does, we'll put him on the air. But brilliant as we are, whenever you schedule an ambassador, it's always good to have a backup, a backup ambassador. And gentlemen, why don't we introduce our audience, our viewers and listeners, to our backup ambassador, Ambassador Ronnie Wexler, our dear friend, yeah. right here in the studio. Ambassador Wexler, how are you, sir? I'm very well, thank you, and thank you for having me today. You got a limousine maybe I could ride in sometime? Or how's absolutely, that anytime. You like Armored, that right? Life? Absolutely. Like, yeah, absolutely. pretty cool stuff. Uh, they give you a credit card? They do. Okay. <laughs> Taxpayers pay for it? You do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. You don't pay your tickets in New York. I know that. You know that? that all the ambassador and diplomatic cars park wherever they want. They get tickets. And we can Immunity. Yeah, they can get away with murder, literally. Yeah. They do. That's right. So, Unfortunately, well. But not Ambassador Wexler. Not, no. uh, Ambassador Wexler, what do you really do? Well, uh, I'm the uh, director or president uh, of the Heritage Study Programs, which is an educational company that uh, is based in Tel Aviv, Israel, and in Boca Raton, Florida. Uh, we take people to Israel. As a matter of fact, we took uh, tens of thousands of people to Israel, uh, both uh, angles of uh, trips to Israel. One, of course, is uh, people go to Israel in order to see the holy sites, uh, walking in the footsteps of Jesus and the patriarchs, uh, visiting all the holy places. But the other one is fact-finding expeditions, where we try to understand the uh, Middle East, uh, current events, and perhaps sometimes even explain them from a biblical point of view. Uh, when we go on uh, expeditions, such as the one we uh, took uh, last year, uh, we meet uh, with policymakers in Israel, IDF uh, representatives. We go on location and uh, we get to understand what the problems in the Middle East uh, are. Uh, Israel uh, often is portrayed in the wrong way in, uh, in the media. We try to get the truth out of uh, what's going on and uh, portray it in, the, in an even way, uh, a balanced and even way. Uh, we visit places where we go to... Uh, actually mingle uh, also with uh, people who live there uh, and uh, we bring to the surface uh, the sites that usually you don't see on that's for sure right. we're gonna we're gonna get into some of those details Ron um, and um, Ronnie Mark Mark Campbell's our director back hello there. do you guys know do you guys know where we were one year ago today. Israel? That's right. We were there <laughs> on one of these fact-finding missions. Frank right. Gaffney and I led the, the tour, <coughs> and um, we went, I think it was the 30th of September right. through the 19th or so of, uh, of October. Now, I don't remember where we were in the 8th. Do you have a, that kind of memory, where we were in the 8th? Uh, I believe we were in Galilee. I believe we were in Galilee. Galilee. Could have been in Galilee. That, I'll tell you what, that was my second time there. We're going, we were supposed to go in November of this year, but that got rescheduled because of the war operation Protective Edge. You were there. Ambassador Wexler was there during Operation Protective Edge. Told me a story a bit earlier. We're gonna, we're gonna let him tell it on the yeah. air. A little, little spooky. But uh, he kept telling us, look, yeah, we're, we're at war, but it's really pretty safe here, uh, which is a, an interesting approach. But we rescheduled the trip to uh, our November trip, 2014, to March of 2015. And our show today, one of the reasons we had uh, 
um, the ambassador, the real ambassador, Uram Ettinger, is because he is the third person with myself, Frank, and him. Right. Good friend of yours, an expert on all things Israel, Israeli, and uh, uh, but we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna explain our trip and reach out to folks who want to come on the trip in the context of the immediate geopolitical issues of the day, Ron. Those who follow our show and our work at the United West are very interested in national security issues. Frank Gaffney, obviously, uh, he's on the tour leading it. So, um, so we go to Israel, and I, as an evangelical Christian, uh, have life-changing moments whenever I'm there. You know, at the the holy sites, and um, and and that element of me is just uh, moved greatly and motivate it greatly. But the national security element of me when we go to Israel is invigorated, informed, and further equipped to stand for, and that's the, the, the big idea for our show today, to stand for Israel as America's primary national security partner. Because as bad as China and Russia may be, the immediate existential, which means um, subjective, out there, it's going to happen. But objective, immediate threat is coming from the Islamic world in the Middle East. There's no denying that. And to underscore that, I want to start this show off with a two-minute disturbing video from a Mujahideen in the UK as he issues. Now, I want the audience to understand this. You're looking at one very eloquent English-speaking Mujahideen, holy warrior. Um, and imagine if you are an 18, 19, 20-year-old disillusioned Muslim who, uh, who hates the West, who hates Jews, hates Christians, and you see this guy with his bandaged right arm, and they didn't pick him with a, with a damaged arm and bandaged arm for no reason. It's there to show the vigor and the vitality and the fight in the Mujahideen against the West. Listen carefully to how he articulates his Islamic State war doctrine. And then toward the end of the video, how he calls into action Muslim kids, Muslim men from all over the world. Let's take a look at this Mujahideen challenge. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. This is a message to that despicable swine, David Cameron. You, along with all the other Western governments, have decided to bomb the Islamic State. So if you were real men, you will send all your forces down on the ground. You will not bomb us from the skies. You will send them all on the ground, fighting us one by one. But you know that in the hearts of your men, they're cowards. So America, you think you're a superpower, when in fact, if you were a superpower, you wouldn't need these 40 other nations to come and fight us. And know that all power belongs to Allah and Allah is with the Muttaqeen. So you can send your planes above us, but know that Allah is above your planes. You're fighting people who love death more than you love life. So send all your forces, send them all, send all your reserves, send all your backups, for we'll send about one by one in coffins. And a message to all the brothers in the UK, know that the Caliphate has been established. And brothers, if this isn't the time you're going to do Hijrah, when is the time? When is the time you're going to do Hijrah? The Caliphate has been established. Why are you still in Dar al-Kufr? What does Dar al-Kufr have to offer you? We have the Islamic State of it, we're fighting Jihad, we've got Ribat. Read the virtues of Jihad, read the virtues of Ribat, the virtues of Kitab, the virtues of dying fi sabilillah. Read all these virtues, yet why are you still in the West? What does the West have to offer you? What does that filthy, despicable country have to offer you? Nothing. The, country, the West offers you the dunya, but here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is offering you Jannah. And a message to all the brothers who cannot do Hijrah. I advise you to respond to the call of the Shaykh, the Mujahid, Abu Muhammad Adnani. Cause terror in the hearts of the Kuffar. You're living in the West. Unlike us, you're blessed that you can cause terror in the hearts, in the hearts of the Kuffar, right in the center, in the center of that Kuffar and in the center of all that Shirk. You can cause terror right from within. So unlike us, you can cause damage, you can cause real damage right within the heart of Dar al-Kuffar. So rise up, my brothers, rise up. Rise up, my brothers, rise up. You can cause damage right in the heart of the kufr. Unbelievable. Let, let's, uh, let's take a step back. Uh, I want to get uh, Mark, Damon, and Ronnie, I want to get your, your impressions of the two-minute Mujahideen challenge to the West, uh, both in terms of fighting 
and, uh, and, and the logic he put behind it uh, in terms of the, the failures of the rest. West, Ron, what, what are, what's your immediate reaction after hearing uh, that? Well, my immediate reaction is that uh, the West had been uh, asleep for a long, long time. This is nothing new. Uh, it, only now it's uh, hitting the, the media and uh, we're starting to see in real time what's going on. But it's been there for the longest time. Uh, we in Israel uh, saw it also. Uh, we know how to uh, attack it from within. We have a very good intelligence that uh, stops things from happening before they actually do happen. But there was a learning experience in Israel too, and we suffered tremendously at some points and <coughs> others. Uh, it is now the time of the West to learn from what Israel, hopefully, they can learn from what Israel had to uh, go through and uh, stop it uh, before it becomes a little bit too late. Uh, look. Uh, to fight the Mujahideen in Afghanistan is one thing. To fight uh, uh, all kind of terrorists in, uh, on their land is fine, you know. Uh, but when they come to uh, your country, especially with passports, uh, that you cannot stop them from coming back, uh, those born uh, here in the United States or in Britain or wherever they come from, uh, it is very hard to detect. Uh, but it's still possible. But we have to be serious about it. First of all, we have to call the war by its name. We're fighting Islam, radical Islam. This is not uh, just a, uh, a war against uh, something that we can define. We can definitely well, define Well, this it. administration so, is having a hard time defining it. So if I get what Ronnie is saying, same stuff, different country. Different country. Uh, yeah, welcome to Hamas. This is what we've been dealing with for the last 20 years. Is that basically what you're saying, Ronnie? It's exactly what I'm saying. It's Hamas, it's Hezbollah, it's even Fatah. Yeah. Anybody who claimed that Fatah is, uh, is, is not radical is not um, in tune with what's going on. Uh, Fatah is teaching their children to hate Jews from, uh, from, from grade uh, uh, zero in, in, in schools. Uh, uh, Fatah is no different than Hamas. Uh, those who say that the friend, uh, uh, the enemy of our enemy is our friend, uh, not knowing what they're saying. Uh, they're all the same. They're all derivative of the same group. Uh, uh, Islam, is the radical Islam, uh, the brotherhood, it's all the same. They just call themselves <laughs> so, different names. <laughs> it's all the same. same. And, and well, what, what's, what's interesting about Ronnie, uh, and for our, our viewers and listeners out there, it's 17 minutes. 17 minutes after 4 o'clock on the East Coast, October 8th, you're listening to Tom Trento. Our special guest in studio is Ronnie Wexler. And we got uh, all the guys out here uh, on the show. What's interesting about Ronnie, who owns a tour company, that takes people on tours to Israel. Sounds like a nice kind of uh, simple, clean, you know, wonderful job, fact-finding mission. Ronnie was born in Israel. He's an Israeli. He fought in the, uh, the Six-Day War. He fought in the Yom Kippur War for his country. Right. So he has exchanged gunfire in anger with that guy's grandfather, that guy's <laughs> father who was, who was just there, literally or metaphorically, and Ronnie's telling us, you know, the West is waking up to this because of these beheadings and all of that, but this is what you guys have been dealing with and deal with on an everyday basis. Damon, your thoughts? Well, it's really, I mean, we've been saying it for years. It's only a matter of time. You know, Israel is the canary in the coal mine. We've seen it happen there for years, and we've, know, we've talked about the soft target issues here in the United States before, and that's really the most concerning. I mean, is really the soft targets and what they could do to the economy and or you know or you look at biological now with the ebola scare imagine if someone is really trying to spread something on purpose yeah this is really a bizarre time because we have today on the 8th of october we have today today right now in front of us we have a devastating uh potential human disaster uh in in the uh, uh north western part of, uh, of Syria in a town called Kobani. We're going to look at a map in a second. And also, last night on the 7th of October on, on the uh, cable stations, former uh, Secretary of Defense, former head of the CIA, Leon Panetta, Democrat, ripping Wasn't that his amazing? boss. Wasn't that amazing? Ripping his boss on national security issues, trying to do it nicely. Now, we all know that Panetta is setting up the Clintons, his very dear friends, to 
try to be the next president, Hillary Clinton. But he could have done it in a very diplomatic way where he didn't throw Obama mm -hmm. under, under the, the, uh, the, uh, the camel. Throw right. Obama under the camel. Uh, he, he could have done it that way. But he's simply saying, this guy is checked out. He's a smart yeah. guy. He's checked out. He doesn't want to do this. He can't make decisions. And now we got this Islamic State, you know, moving in Syria. And Syria, how far is the Syrian border, Mr. Expert on all things is Israeli, from the Israeli border? Well, uh, the Israel, Israel and Syria share a border. Right there, you know. You took us there last year uh, on the border. The interesting part, uh, talk about this, uh, this uh, uh, groups, the different groups in Syria, uh, there is a border crossing in the Golan Heights. You and I actually visited uh, right. the last right. year. Right, we were there. And uh, we saw the Syrian army still in control of this border. Uh, since then, it uh, changed hands several times. Uh, <laughs> sometimes you see the Hezbollah uh, flag on uh, top of that uh, uh, field box in, in the border crossing. Some other time you see, uh, you don't see ISIS yet, but you see the other groups right. uh, in that part of the border. Uh, uh, ISIS is uh, very much involved now in fighting in the northern part of uh, Syria, which is pretty far from Israel. But the other groups are fighting each other on the border in the Golan. Uh, nothing is aimed at Israel, of course. Uh, they know better. Uh, however, from time to time, there's a stray, you know, bullet uh, here and there. Right. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, there was an airplane that was shut down. Uh, Came into Israeli airspace. Yeah, yeah. The Golan right. Heights. I'm sure it was a mistake. I'm sure it didn't mean any harm. But Israel cannot take a chance. So the moment it crossed the border, it was shut down. Yeah. Um, I want to go into the, to the map. And Ronnie, you can help us ex understand the geography here. And let me tell you, folks, at 21 minutes after on WSBR, Tom Trento here, on the AM station, on uh, iHeartRadio, on the UnitedWest.org, coming to you every single day, 4 o'clock p.m. East Coast time. That's 1 o'clock in the afternoon for you non-mathematicians in California. And if we're on at 4 o'clock, Ronnie, math test, if we're on 4 o'clock in America, what time is it in Israel? Uh, it is uh, now... No, right, right, right. Yeah, what time is it right now, according to that clock? Well, seven hours, it's... Uh... Uh, 11 o'clock at night. 11 o'clock at night. You guys listen to uh, the radio or watch internet TV at 11 o'clock at listen night? Listen to iHeartRadio? Absolutely. All right. <laughs> when you go back, we want you to kind of push our show. Oh, oh you I got heard. it. You got uh, it. iHeart, right. iHeartRadio. You can listen anywhere in the world. In Israel, right. But help us understand the geography here. And, and Mark, you know this as well as I do. You've been right. with me on these trips. Uh, you, could, you could look at maps all day long. When you're standing... When you're standing in Tel Aviv at that, uh, um, that uh, the, in the occupied territory of the West Bank, in that settlement that looked bigger than some developments in Boca Raton. What's the name of that settlement? What we occupied? I, I don't understand what <laughs> occupied means. The <laughs> occupied area, right. Well, well, you guys are <laughs> occupying somebody's land. You, you really didn't have Am it 4,000 years show? ago. Yeah. <laughs> you really didn't have it 4,000 4, years ago. It was liberated. Uh, oh, that's right. Um, when you took us to that settlement. al Menashe, it's called, and it's that's about amazing. 10 kilometers uh, from Tel Aviv. Uh, when you stand on, uh, on a hill there, uh, you see Tel Aviv just uh, before you. Uh, anybody with uh, a rifle, a good rifle, can actually... Uh, sit up there and shoot at uh, anything that moves that was, in Tel Aviv. That was eye-opening for sure. When we're standing there, and this was last year, right this time, this week we were in Israel, we're standing in this, uh, this developed, phenomenally developed small uh, development, small little city basically, um, in Judea Samaria. The bad guys call it occupied land. And we're looking down at Ben-Gurion. You're watching the airplanes land. And you, you don't really see that on the map. You see, you know, the mountains look a little different. But when you're standing there, you go... Completely different story. You go, yeah. I, you know, I can go get weapons tomorrow that can launch stuff into Ben-Gurion, and you shut down the airport. Well, you know, when, I, when I was, we were coming back, after we left Israel and came back, and we're sitting in the, the Newark airport, 
and I'm looking out the window of the New York airport, right, and you I can see that. downtown New York, New York City, and we're thinking, wow, that's about the distance from in the West Bank to Ben Gurion Airport, and it it really brings it home how close it, it is. I mean, it's literally right across the river, right down the thing. You can see it. You, you can, can see, see it. it. And, and Fatah, uh, I've heard some ramblings, Ron. You can help us out here. Fatah is, is, is starting to present the idea of bringing the Islamic State into the West Bank, joining with them to form an Islamic State of Muslims, the Ummah, in the West Bank, then smuggle weapons in, and they said, we will take over Israel if we do that. Have you heard that? Well, there are rumors, but, uh, you know, my mother used to say, when there's smoke, there's fire. Uh, but more importantly, uh, if you look at the territory that you called before occupied, which is uh, Judea and Samaria, You're right. uh, one, you know, one border would be then Israel, Tel Aviv, but the other side, will go as far as Afghanistan and Pakistan and all the Arab lands, There's one mass of land. That's right. That, that, is, that, that is, is endless. Uh, you're talking about uh, close to uh, uh, 700 million people who live in that uh, part of the world, uh, and there would be nothing between it and Israel. So now you're talking about 10 kilometer, kilometers uh, miles, distance between miles, the Mediterranean yeah. Mediterranean and that part of uh, the West Bank that we visited, mm -hmm. and we, al Menashe it's called, and we saw Tel Aviv just before us. Uh, that would be Afghanistan now, basically. That would be that would territorial, yeah. territorial space between Tel Aviv and all the way up to Afghanistan, Pakistan, and everything. And, and why that's important, folks, and I hadn't realized that. Why that's important is because the enemy we're fighting, the uh, Islamic Jihad enemy, they don't uh, view or respect territorial boundaries. They are an ummah. Essentially, all land is theirs given from Allah. Certainly Israel is theirs. They view that. So if, if the, uh, the Israelis were to give the Judea-Samaria area over to the Islamic jihadis, to Fatah, to Gaza, to Hamas, then the uh, eastern border now goes from Tel Aviv from a Muslim point of view, because there's no boundaries right. and, and no national identities, it's the Ummah, all the way, thousands and thousands of miles. So you can get on your camel in Afghanistan and come all the way right up to Tel Aviv, right? and you'd be welcome. You know, this is not a futuristic Shoot. image, you know, because if you look at it, all these countries that you mentioned before, Iraq and, and uh, Syria and, and Jordan and uh, Lebanon, they didn't exist uh, before the Sykes-Picot uh, division yeah, yeah. of the land. So in 1921, when, when the, Brits, uh, the British and the French, after World War I, decided to divide the Middle East, that was one piece of land that was controlled by the Ottoman Empire. So the Uma that you're talking about now actually existed before under the Ottoman Empire. So you don't have to be a genius to figure out what kind of mess of land we're talking about when, when, we when this might happen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Ottoman Empire were a little bit more civilized maybe than ISIS, but uh, still, you know, there was, there was one piece of land that belonged to one and, group. And, and the, the intellectual leaders of the Islamic Jihadi movement, of the Caliphate movement right now, are teaching exactly what Rani is referring to here. They're saying, folks, you know, less than 100 years ago, we had all of this land, you know, and now we need to reclaim it. And, and imagine being a 65, 70-year-old intellectual mujahideen. You've been through the Afghanistan-Soviet uh, wars. You've, you've fought with uh, Osama bin Laden. Now you see the Islamic State having all of this military victory, and you start to read your historical perspective of the Ottoman Empire into today's geographical, geopolitical context, and you say, this is our hour, and you start teaching the, the, uh, the, the uh, imams to start uh, giving these sermons on Friday that we need now worldwide to come to the Middle East and fight in the, in the uh, 
in the jihad because the Islamic State, the caliphate, as the Mujahideen guy that we saw earlier says, has been established. Perfect situation for the enemy right now. And what is the enemy doing today, October 8th, 2014? Let's pull up uh, Kobani, little village, 45,000 people in Syria on the Turkish border. It has been surrounded for the past couple of weeks. And uh, the, the, I, the Islamic State warriors have uh, put a pincher, uh, pincer move together to block any retreat. And the West, Western generals are now saying, you see it on your screen, are now saying there's going to be mass slaughters if indeed the Islamic State takes over this city today or tomorrow. Take a look at it right there. Now, uh, that little gray area at the top of your screen is Kobani, and uh, we'll bring it down here in this view. And you see all that land, empty land area around uh, Kobani? That's, that's pretty much flat land, and we could have destroyed them with airstrikes pretty easily before the the ISIS troops came in there. And that's what General McInerney was talking about yesterday. And uh, that, that that's just pretty, um, you know, pretty wide open territory to do that. All right, it's 4.30 on, uh, did we just, uh, was that noise, the uh, Yes, that, that, that's the yarn. Yeah, 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 I want you to get that all set up. 4.30 uh, in the afternoon, Tom Trento here, WSBR <laughs> with our, uh, special in-studio guest, Mr. Ronnie Wexler, and we're discussing the current situation yep. in the Middle East. In particular, we just took a look at uh, the uh, Syrian city of Kobani and its right. uh, horrible outlook for the future. But do we have our special guest, uh, Ambassador Yuram Ettinger, on? Yes, we do. Yes, okay. we do. Let's put him on Let's and uh, we'll on say and, hello. Uh, one second. We need to turn our video uh, off. You guys, you turn guys our video do. off. Take your key. Key. Okay, go ahead. That. Here we go. All right. He is here. Ambassador. He can't see us right now? He no. Can. He can't. Okay. okay yeah, he can. Hi, Tom Trento here and uh, your friend uh, Ronnie Wexler to my right, actually. To right. My... There we go. Okay. All right, we're getting uh, this uh, live Skype in from Israel right now. We have the ambassador. As soon as all that's hooked up. Yep. But, um, Ron, uh, the, the prospects for this... This, uh, it's, an, it's a town with Muslims in it, with Christians in it. Um, you know, what do you, what do you make out of that? Right. What, what do you think is going to happen today okay. in Kobani? Here I we think go. Oh, we have him? Yeah, we have him, oh. and he's on, he's on live now. We have his video feed off, so here we go. There's, there is the ambassador. Okay. We, oh, there he is. <laughs> ambassador, how are you? I don't think he can see us. No, he right? can't see us. Uh, you can't see us, but Tom Trento here with with Ronnie Wexler in the studio. Hi, sir. How are you doing today? Very well. Thank you very much. Good, good. You want to say hello to your friend there? Hello, Yom. How are you? <laughs> very well. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Chag Sameach. Happy uh, Feast of Tabernacles and uh, Happy New Year. Thank you. Same to you and all of Israel. All right, Ambassador, we... Um, we uh, Wanted to take a look today and get your expertise on the percolating situation in, in the Middle East and the four or five hot spots that, are, uh, uh, that, that, that the Israelis have to deal with. In fact, in March, uh, yourself, myself, and Frank Gaffney are leading a, uh, a fact-finding mission put together by our friend Ronnie Wexler. And we have um, tight, entitled the program, Taking a Look at the Four Hotspots. Ron, what, what were those four hotspots again? Well, the Gaza with uh, Hamas, uh, Lebanon with Hezbollah, uh, rebels in uh, Syria, and of course, uh, a ticking bomb uh, called East Jerusalem. Those are the four hotspots. Those are the four areas. And let's start out with a, uh, uh, an article you wrote just a few days ago regarding the enemy of my enemy. And, and let's lead your portion of the show with the, uh, the Iranian threat. Give us the gist of, uh, of your view and this, this thinking about the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Well, uh, currently uh, there is a, a delusion entertained by Western policymakers that uh, Iran, uh, the enemy of uh, America's enemy, ISIS, uh, could be potentially America's uh, ally, 
And uh, that is a repetition of a similar state of mind, which led the U.S. back in the, at the end of the 1980s, beginning of 1990s, to assume then that uh, Saddam Hussein of Iraq, uh, the enemy of uh, Iran, uh, could be the potential ally of the U.S. Therefore, Saddam Hussein benefited from uh, a very, very strong uh, strategic cooperation with the U.S. And uh, without getting into too many details, he was led to believe that he could uh, invade Kuwait, potentially surge then into Saudi Arabia with impunity. Uh, and uh, that policy, that reckless policy, the enemy of my enemies, potentially my friend, led then to Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, which led to the first Gulf War and the second Gulf War, potentially today the third Gulf uh, War, all of which, all of which could have been prevented if uh, then uh, President Bush Sr. And, uh, and the Secretary of State Jim Baker would have understood that the enemy of my enemy is also my uh, enemy. Uh, today, Iran is indeed the enemy of uh, ISIS, but it takes one to ignore completely the ideological background of uh, the Ayatollahs and the Mullahs, Mullahs of uh, Iran. It takes one to overlook completely uh, the fact that Iran is a world co-leader uh, or co-sponsor of uh, international Islamic anti-U.S. terrorism. It takes one to ignore the fact that Iran maintains very intimate strategic ties with all of America's enemies and adversaries in the world. It takes to do all that, namely to uh, not to be able to read the writing on the wall, to assume that Iran uh, could be co-opted into an alliance with the U.S. continuation of the current uh, policy uh, by the U.S. towards Iran would lead to much more dramatic cost than the cost of the faulty policy towards Iraq. Then it led to a series of conventional wars and one and a quarter trillion dollars financial cost uh, today. Uh, a faulty policy towards Iran could lead to a devastating global nuclear war with a mega trillion dollar cost to the American taxpayer. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So, sir, would it, would it be accurate to say, and for our viewers and our listeners, we're on, uh, on the AM radio in South Florida, we're on iHeartRadio worldwide on the internet, theunitedwest.org, Tom Trento at... 38 minutes after 4 p.m. October 8th on the East Coast. Uh, Ambassador, would it be fair to say that the, uh, the, the historic hatred between the Sunni, the Muslim Brotherhood side, the Hamas side, and the Shia, the Iranian, the Hezbollah side, the historic vitriol, the historic hatred is, um, is second to the hatred of Islamic jihadis, whether from the Sunni or Shia side, against the West in particular, against Jews and Christians? Well, I, I would say that today, uh, uh, Iran and ISIS fight one against the other. However, both of them consider the U.S., in particular uh, Western civilizations in uh, general, uh, Christians and uh, Jews, in fact, also uh, Hindus and uh, Buddhists, uh, but primarily the U.S. as the major obstacle on the road of attaining their own goal, which is for Iran, first of all, domination of the Gulf, then domination of the Middle East, obviously overpowering Sunni Islam, and then the rest of the globe. The U.S. power projection in the Gulf, in the Indian Ocean, in the Middle East, and throughout the world constitute an insurmountable obstacle which they intend to overcome by acquiring the mega capability, namely nuclear uh, capability. At that stage, uh, they are going to subordinate 
the pro-American Arab oil producing countries of the Persian Gulf, which would cause havoc as far as the supply and the price of oil, therefore would uh, cause another devastating blow to the American and Western uh, economies. It's going to intensify uh, problems emanating from Venezuela, which already is a thorn in the back of the U.S., already has Iranian missiles on its uh, ground, but being transformed into an ally of a nuclear Iran would pose further threat to America's homeland security and national uh, security. And certainly, uh, should Iran become uh, nuclear, it is going to devastate the major axis of America's national security, namely America's posture of deterrence. Uh, no American president would dare the Iranians into a who blinks first a nuclear race. Uh, and certainly no American president would risk uh, becoming a target for even one nuclear warhead on uh, New York, Washington, Chicago or Los Angeles. And therefore the only question left once there is a nuclear Iran, uh, how effective is going to be Iranian pressure on the U.S. for major uh, strategic uh, concessions, maybe pull out from the Gulf, maybe pull out from the Indian Ocean, maybe pull out from the uh, Persian uh, Gulf, and I would say all the way to the American mainland where you already have hundreds of uh, slipper cells, many of them supported uh, by Iran. Well, Ron, on the uh, well, I do uh, like the on countdown the feast, I... on the feast of uh, tabernacles, Tabernacle. celebrating a bountiful, plentiful production and honoring God, and uh, historically, to hear the ambassador dispassionately lay out an apocalyptic scenario is a little disconcerting, to say the least. But uh, I don't know. Can you find any fault with what he just said, Ron? No, I think that uh, what the ambassador said is exactly, he reads the map uh, exactly the way it is. Uh, there's, uh, it's, it's amazing that uh, the United States of America is not seeing the same map. Uh, and uh, even any talk about uh, allowing uh, uh, Iran to be uh, part of uh, this right. coalition <clears throat> is, is, uh, is, is, is so... Uh, unbelievably incorrect that uh, it shouldn't be even entertained. Yet, uh, it looks like the American administration at the moment uh, uh, may just uh, have it happen. And the reason for it is that uh, the need not to have an American uh, soldier on the ground would lead to all kinds of mistakes, and some of them are irreversible. And unfortunately, what uh, what uh, Ambassador just predicted that might happen, may just happen. You know what? We just had a picture of um, President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu up on the screen. In light of what you just said, Ronnie, and in light of what you said, Ambassador, we have a very weird situation going on right now in the United States between uh, administrations with Israel. Uh, we have Valerie Jarrett, who is the brain and the strength behind President Obama. And we all know that she was born in Iran and she is pro-Iran. We understand that, that's a factual situation, not, not dispute it. But the, the relationship between Netanyahu and Obama, particularly this last week, over settlements, issues, over American policy, uh, Josh Ernest, the spokesperson for the president, uh, responding to Netanyahu saying, we're just doing what, what Americans do by building out our land. And Josh Ernest saying, yeah, well, we gave you the money for Iron Derm Dome. We're protecting your citizens. <clears throat> Ambassador right. Ettinger, at uh, 44 minutes after 4 o'clock on our show on October 8th, 2014, what is the state of the relationship between President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu? Well, we, we have here uh, two... Uh, scenarios. One is the relationship between the two administrations, uh, Obama and Netanyahu, on one hand, uh, where there is no chemistry, and that's uh, mildly uh, uh, describing it. However, 
there is also the other uh, context. And the other context has to do with the fact that, thank God, uh, the U.S. is not a monarchy. And uh, in the U.S. we also have uh, legislature and we also have uh, defense establishment, national security, homeland security establishment. And the fact is that while there is no, there is no chemistry, no good chemistry between the two leaders of the U.S. and uh, Israel, the strategic cooperation is at an all-time high. It's at an all-time high because there are major players on Capitol Hill and within the military and defense and the homeland security establishment in the U.S. who, unlike the president, do recognize the fact that at this point, with the U.S. in retreat from uh, various parts of the world, with the U.S. cutting uh, very painfully its own defense uh, budget, the threats are mounting and uh, Europe has lost its will. And therefore, the only, the only potential effective ally of the U.S., which is able to make up for the shortening American strategic hand, is uh, Israel. And therefore, for instance, exactly. today, special operation forces on their way to Afghanistan do stop in Israel for three, four-week training uh, in Israel by Israel's top experts on car bombs, uh, uh, suicide bombers, and most importantly, the IEDs, the improvised explosive devices. We have, uh, as a matter of fact, today in Fort Leavenworth, uh, Kansas, which is the intellectual mecca of the U.S. Army, where the U.S. Army formulates its battle tactics. The battle tactics are formulated according to generals in Fort Leavenworth, uh, Kansas. The battle tactics are formulated based on the Israeli book, namely America benefits from Israeli military uh, precedents. And America fights its wars based on Israeli precedents, which saves many American uh, lives. When it comes to fighting in Afghanistan or or who knows, maybe again in Iraq, America also benefits from Israeli developed unmanned aerial vehicles, which uh, does enable American uh, GIs to overwhelm uh, the terrorists in their own trenches, rather than wait for them in uh, America's, Americans' own uh, trenches. Uh, you shift gear to the American defense uh, industry, and if you were to make a visit to the plant of General Dynamics in Fort Worth, uh, Texas, uh, you would be privy to uh, the most outstanding cooperation whereby uh, there is an Israeli Air Force team on location 24-7, sharing with the American manufacturer lessons drawn by Israel as far as operations and maintenance and repairs. And when I asked the plant manager how many modifications are based on Israeli lessons? The response was well over 700 modifications. Uh, the cockpit, 50% uh, based on Israeli lessons. The firing control, 75% based on Israeli lessons. And he quantified it in the following mega billion dollar bonanza for the manufacturer. I assume uh, Lockheed Martin, the manufacturer of the F-15, benefits in a similar way the manufacturer of tanks and armed personnel carriers, missile launchers and missile benefit in a similar way. And give you a particular example, I visited the office of the congressman from Chattanooga, Tennessee, where Northrop Grumman manufactures the robots which neutralize explosives. And the uh, congressman told me that in the, that plant, they benefit from the fact that Israel is their number one customer because Israel uses those robots, robots to neutralize explosives which are uh, installed by Palestinian terrorists. We share with the plant in Chattanooga on a weekly basis lessons drawn by Israel. And according to the congressman from Chattanooga, therefore, the plant from Chattanooga is increasing its exports is enhancing its research and development and expanding employment. 
if I would add the roughly 1,000 U.S. military defense systems employed by Israel, and I would quantify the benefits to America's defense industry drawn by lessons uh, concluded by Israel, I would say that we're talking about mega billion dollar annual bonanza to the American defense uh, industry, which is very, very beneficial to employment, research and development and exports in America. The bottom line, we're not talking about one-way street type of relations. We're talking about two-way street, which are mutually beneficial uh, ties, win-win uh, type of ties. And the war in Gaza, by the way, is a very classic reflection, uh, very sadly, tragically, the White House spokesman uh, mentioned Iron Dome, but he failed. He failed, whether intentionally or intentionally, to mention that Iron Dome was fully, fully developed. The development was fully funded by Israel, but according to the agreement with the U.S., the total development has already been shared with Raytheon in the U.S. Manufacturing is moving rapidly to the U.S., and once exports start, it will be exclusively from the U.S. Again, another example how Israeli experience benefits America's defense industry, national security, and homeland security. Wow, wow. Uh, we're pretty familiar around here in the United West with uh, Israel's involvement on national security issues, but I was not aware to the degree that you just explained. And um, we have just a few minutes left. We're going to have to have you back to go through those points in detail. Because we argue, and I think quite effectively, that Israel is our number one national security partner. Uh, we argue that, um, but to, to see to the depth and degree uh, the, that it is, um, that's just very, very helpful. We just have a few minutes left, uh, Ambassador. And folks, with us today is Ambassador Yoram Ettinger. He uh, serves for over 20 years as a, as a consultant to, uh, to the Israeli Knesset, Israeli leaders, to the United States leaders, United States businessmen, very involved in, in all of this. Um, Ambassador, a couple of minutes left. We have a couple of questions uh, we want to ask you. Uh, and if you can give us just a, a short answer, because we want to get some in. We had a whole list of questions for you. We know you got tied up a bit. One question, then we want to go into our, our trip in March. One question is uh, on Operation Protective Edge. Uh, when the Hamas obviously continued firing missiles, firing rockets. Uh, is, is it true, help us understand whether or not the Hamas, a, uh, a Sunni organization, a wing of the Muslim Brotherhood, is indeed now Hamas warriors starting to migrate into, uh, into Syria to join with, uh, with ISIS and, um, and, and fight the Syrians? Is that happening? Well, I, I would not be surprised, but before they migrate to Syria, they are intimately, intimately uh, cooperating, colluding uh, with the Muslim Brotherhood terrorists in Egypt, trying to topple the uh, regime of General uh, Sisi, uh, Hamas, uh, was very active in toppling the Mubarak regime, which unfortunately was also facilitated uh, that toppling by the policy of President uh, Obama. Uh, General Sisi has been very tough on, uh, on uh, Hamas. In addition, Hamas, which is a wing or subsidiary of the Muslim Brotherhood, is also very active in southern Jordan, trying to topple the pro-American Hashemite regime in uh, Jordan. And again, the bottom line, uh, Israel obviously is fighting its own war against Hamas, Palestinian terrorism in Gaza. But while doing that, Israel is also fighting the war of the uh, pro-American Arab regimes in the Middle East. And therefore, in many respects, Israel is fighting also America's own war. The way the Israel's war against Palestinian terrorism goes, so will go the question of stability, 
of pro-American Arab regimes in Jordan, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and that's the reason that for the first time these Arab regimes were subtly supporting Israel's war on Palestinian terrorism and very, very overtly anti-Hamas during that war. They know that Israel is indeed fighting their own war against Hamas. By the way, just like they know that Israel's confrontation with Iran is in many respects their own confrontation against Iran. Well, now what about what about a scenario, a bizarre scenario where the Hamas, the war fighters for the Hamas, join with Hezbollah in the in southern Lebanon for a potential engagement with Israel up north? What well, in the Middle East, uh, the only thing which is predictable is unpredictability. <laughs> Uh, all scenarios have to be uh, taken into consideration. One needs to be always ready for the worst case, which usually is the realistic case in the Middle East. And one of those scenarios, obviously, is Hamas collaboration with uh, Hezbollah. Although, as I said before, uh, I consider Hamas collaboration with anti-Sisi elements in Egypt and anti hashemite elements in Jordan, much more realistic and much more concerning, much more concerning scenario uh, than a scenario which involves uh, Lebanon or Syria. All right, well, we have a couple of minutes left, and um, Ron, we're, we're going to go March 21st of 2015, and the good ambassador is going to be part of our team to learn all of this stuff. What are your thoughts about all this? Ambassador, we are painting a very uh, bleak uh uh, light here uh, on the Middle East, uh, and here we are trying to bring people to Israel. So what can you tell our uh, viewers today uh, in lieu of what uh, they just heard? Uh, is it safe, number one, to go to Israel? Uh, number two, what can we learn uh, visiting Israel that we can learn from uh, this program on television at the moment? Well, f first of all, uh, when it comes to personal safety, uh, the, the proof is in the in the pudding. Uh, we are now. We just entered. In fact, we are entering right, right now the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, Jerusalem is flooded with uh, overseas tourists. By the way, many of them Christians who, who have come here to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacle, which is a universal, not only Jewish uh, holiday. Uh, we are talking about uh, Israel, which, quite frankly is much more safe than any cosmopolitan uh, 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 town in, uh, in the West. Uh, I, we have, uh, I live in Jerusalem. Uh, my, uh, two of my three daughters reside in Tel Aviv. It's a habit for them to return home walking at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and uh, one is not concerned about that in, uh, in Israel. I would say that the chance of being hit uh, by a Palestinian missile in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv or Haifa is by far smaller than the chance of being mugged in Washington <laughs> or New York or Chicago. Yeah, exactly uh, what I was going to bring up. Very. And, uh, and the, the fact is that uh, uh, we are talking uh, uh, now 2014. 2014 has been Israel's best year as far as overseas investment. Um, uh, Intel just invested uh, additional, additional uh, $6 billion in expanding its operations, research and development operations in Israel. $6 billion is an expression of confidence yeah. in the long-term viability of Israel. Intel would not have invested a penny, let alone $6 billion, if they would have felt that uh, Israel is an insecure site. Uh, because they know reality much better than the so-called elite media, therefore they invested. Microsoft, by the way, uh, earlier this morning we heard... Uh, we have a, uh, another, Ambassador, another, we have about 30 seconds left. Okay, another Israeli company for $200 million, they already have, Microsoft already has 
uh, two major uh, uh, research and development centers in, uh, in Israel. When it comes to being optimist or pessimist, I'm mighty, mighty optimist. Uh, 70 years ago, the Jews were uh, rose from the ashes. Look where we are uh, today. The major ally of the U.S. in face of an assault by rogue regimes on Western democracies. Who would have expected that 70 years ago? How can anybody be but mightily uh, optimist? And on that note, we have to end right now, Ambassador Ettinger. We thank you very much. Ronnie Wexler, we thank you. You want to come on the trip with all of us, folks? Contact me, Tom at theunitedwest.org. Tom at theunitedwest.org. We'll see you folks tomorrow. Take care now.